Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. And I'm Ed And today we're going to continue our coverage of Wizard Magazine. But before we do, I want to remind everybody to like this video, subscribe to Cartoonist Kayfabe, hit that bell icon to be notified when a new video is posted on Cartoonist Kayfabe. This will help you mitigate the, car the Kayfabe effect. You'll be notified when a new video goes up, which means you can be the first one out there uh, shopping for whatever gem we have uncovered that month. And also, let the video play through to the end. That helps uh, other car comics fans find Cartoonist Kayfabe. It'll populate in the uh, YouTube algorithm, so that's very helpful in helping people uh, learn about Cartoonist Kayfabe. Now, Jimmy, uh, it was showed up in the comments somewhere, man. I think, I think you might have been confused about when your last issues were because somebody pulled out a letter from James Rugg in uh, Wizard number 60. James Rugg, Indiana, PA. Have you tracked down that, that issue? I mean, I have it. I, I have I, it, but I, I didn't pull it out? it out. I do not have any memory of writing to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to Wizard Magazine, but the time and the location fit. So how many James Ruggs could have been running around Indiana, PA in 1996? I don't know, man. I need to read that letter and see what's up. I can't wait to hear what you have to say about Starman <laughs> comics. <laughs> Or, uh, you know, what were you fucking with at the time, man? Hey, I have no idea. That's a, that's a, that's a lot of water under the bridge, as they say. <laughs> that's a long time ago, man. But uh, I am curious to check that out. It's it's a funny... Uh, so you didn't even know that your letter was, was, was printed or anything? I didn't even know I wrote a letter. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a blur of those college years, right? <laughs> Uh, this one is June 1995, by the way, to yeah. give us a little, a little context of when this is happening. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comic books that Jimmy and I make uh, coming out in March, early March. Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one is going to hit the stands. Uh, there was a ransomware attack at uh, the Diamond Distribution offices, which prevented a lot of stores from getting their final orders in before the due date. Uh, what I'm saying is, this comic is going to be uh, a little more scarce than the rest, and I need it to uh, sell out immediately. I think that would be a good show of the, the, the Kayfabe audience. These are the, some of the retail incentive variant covers to go along with that issue. Right now, at this very moment, you could grab Red Room, the anti-social network trade paperback that collects the 2021 season of uh, Red Room Comics. Rising Tide Raises All Ships. Some other stuff in the back catalog that uh, is still on the stands and easily available uh, through uh, your local comic shop if it's a good one, and Amazon if your shop isn't. Uh, WYSIWYG, Portrait of a Serial Hacker, is uh, the life story of a computer hacker from the birth of high technology through the phone system up to uh, WikiLeaks, essentially, man. 288-page graphic novel. Uh, I sort of made my initial name on uh, the Hip Hop Family Tree comics. Uh, four volumes of that are finally back in print after um, Kayfabe coming out and selling out a whole bunch of comics. Uh, at comic shops and in Amazon, but these are back in print as a box set and as individual issues. And uh, X-Men Grand Design, man, my three volume set of treasury editions is still out there on the stands. They keep it readily available in print and there is an omnibus version of that where I take 300 issues of X-Men comics, try to tell a complete cohesive story using all of that material. Get these comics at your local comic shop. Support, support comic, cartoonist Kayfabe that way. King Kayfabe or Jim Rugg has his Grand Design comic coming out at this moment. Jimmy, let's clear a little space. Can you grab these, these guys off? Hulk Grand Design, Monster and Madness, coming out in uh, March and April, where Jimmy's taking 40, 50 years worth of Incredible Hulk comics, probably 10,000 pages worth of material, distilling it down into an 80-page essential narrative that you're going to have to get your hands on. And it's the 60th anniversary of, of, of the Hulk, man. What better way to get in and uh, enjoy one of Marvel's sort of crown jewel achievements in their uh, catalog? These are the variant covers to go along with Hulk grand design. The Eddie P variant. Peach Momoko, Marcos Martin, and Uncle Jeff Darrow does a variant cover for uh, the, the second issue, or, or the Madness issue of Hulk Grand Design. And these are the books of gems that are in print at this very moment that we need you guys to goose the numbers on uh, those Amazon ranking uh, charts for. Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive collects all of Jimmy's uh, albums that were published by uh, Image Comics, plus a lot of material 
that uh, ended up in editions of like 50, 100, you know, these seasonal specials, Halloween special, Christmas special. You got to read those comics, man. Some of Jimmy's darkest stuff, especially at Christmas, <laughs> that Christmas one. And uh, Plain Janes with Cecil Castellucci. Look at the page count of this, man. It is a shoujo manga of a bunch of teen teenage girl artists who sort of Banksy up and Shepherd Fairy this town, get in all kinds of adventures, all kinds of trouble. Jimmy, I swear you draw me on one of these pages early <laughs> on, man. I see a little gap tooth, dude, when I was just wearing those white t-shirts every day. Uh, multicolored, heck of a, heck of a project. Took at least 10, 15 years to uh, to draw this thing over time, man, and uh, worthy of anybody's book bookshelf. Uh, but now that we finished paying the bills, let's get back to the video. And uh, let's let's dive in, man. I love the first ad that we see here. Barry Windsor Smith did all these covers for Wildstorm Rising, the uh, five-year celebration of Wildstorm Studios, not of Image, but of Jim Lee's studio. And so he wanted to do a big crossover, and he got Barry Windsor Smith to do the covers of all these issues. So and, we're going to see a few of them in here. Yeah, and I think he does interiors of at least something. Yeah, he might do the first issue, uh, interiors for what launched that uh, crossover. How about that for DC springing for a nice two-page ad for Sovereign 7, the Chris Claremont. This is, I don't know, a couple years after Claremont leaves X-Men, I guess a few years, and uh, launching a new team with Dwayne Turner on your uh, on your pencils. And look at this right here. Read this piece right there, Jimmy. Sovereign 7 and all related in DC, a trademark and copyright, 1995 Chris Claremont. How interesting, right? Like this is a, a different time in comics history that DC would, would, would set up that deal. Yeah, for sure, man. But you do that with the guy that uh, you know sold millions and millions of comics for, for, the, for the other side. Uh, Dwayne Turner on the art chores. And it's an interesting approach because he can... You know, he's, it's almost like he, what the kids are buying these days is that Jim Lee looking stuff. So he'll, he'll give you a little of that, but he has the academic chops to back it up. Yeah. You know, he's not like those studio guys that worked for Jim Lee or whatever. In, interesting artist. You know, like he does do a stint with Todd McFarlane and Spawn. Yeah. Um, I knew him first from a Black Panther uh, miniseries that he did that was reproduced from his pencils, which yeah. I had never seen anything like that up to that point. So, yeah, good, a good artist. And uh, I always wonder, like, why does that book not go, you know, Sovereign 7? Because you think that's a nice creative team and there's some incentives there. He owns the uh, copyright. Like, what? why didn't that click? And it made me think, like, there's a lot of Chris Claremont comics that I don't connect with. That's and uh, maybe X-Men's the exception. That's true. And it's like... Superheroes are of a time, you know, and and uh, very few break out like after that time. They all feel like uh, Gabriel Brothers versions of superheroes, you know. And like looking at those characters, there's nothing so inspiring about any of these. No, characters, they are very generic. You know, super generic, and uh, it's it's hard to pit this up against even you know the green lantern costume or something it's so 90s yeah i also wonder like creating something new is different than working on something established yeah. you know and and building something new is hard because you need us to connect to a few of these characters you need to have some drama that makes us come back like there's a lot of stuff to do and it's kind of different than you know writing an ongoing series for 15 years yeah uh, Garib Seamus comes back in here with his uh, editorial page. Like, I don't think he's written one for a while, but now he's back. And, and of course, because he's plugging some new stuff like uh, Inquest. Inquest? Yeah, yeah Inquest. It's, it's their, their... their gaming, their gaming uh, magazine for uh, collectible card games. They, they branch out. Like, so they'll, they'll have the collectible card game stuff, and then they'll have the toy magazine. Uh, and at a certain point, it's still even in the uh, 2000s, like I was still like living here, went to the dentist's office, and uh, in the um, lobby there's like Fortune magazine, and it's and it's uh, in my mind's eye, a topless Garib Sheamus with big ass boxing gloves on, talking about how he owns uh, uh, the, a certain demographic of like 18 to 24 year or 18 to 35 year old men, and he was like involving himself in some new MMA kind of uh enterprise <laughs> ridiculous so like he became you know a de facto right. uh, voice of you know boys from a you know certain buying age also plugs the wizard world uh the america online uh wizard presence dude it's real funny like throughout this issue they i guess the term website took a little while to gel yeah. because they they would call it like web product like all sorts of stuff because like the old web 
was actually fairly useless. Like you would go to the postgazette.com or whatever your town's newspaper was, and it would be one page telling you how to subscribe to it. And here's a phone number to call. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> right. there's, there was no information. Like everybody was so stingy and maybe justifiably so because our newspaper comes out just a couple of days a week. It's 20 pages. There's typos. <laughs> like, like every, like the world is fucked because it is goddamn internet and World Wide web and all this shit. That's funny. How about this? Did you read this letter, dude, about Kingpin comics that that was an ad in some of the earliest issues of Wizard that we covered, and what it is, is uh, kind of like how bougie people have a guy to invest in artwork right. for them. Kingpin Comics had a, a deal where you just send them 150 bucks, and they're going to invest in the most valuable comics of that month for you, and oh, just boy. warehouse them for yeah. you. Yeah. So wow. they're li literally just taking your money. <laughs> oh, man. Years go by... This magazine is indicative of the death. Like, like the bubble has burst, man. Uh, completely. You'll hear it from everybody's mouth. And uh, these kids are like, you know what? We want, we want those comics. We want the comics that we invested in. Call up Kingpin Comics. Uh, invested over 900 bucks with them. How many months in a row is that? Jeez, yeah. Six so, months, man. So, uh... The guys at Kingpin were like, we have to send you the comics, like, blah, blah, blah. Um, they keep calling, and they, and they get nothing. They get they, no responses, even. Uh, these were an ad in the old uh, Wizard magazines, and then the people at Wizard are like, nah, yeah, you got taken for a ride. Like, you got to call your attorney general or something in Arizona or wherever you live. Yeah, Wow. That's their only legal recourse to recover your lost money. <laughs> Called the Attorney General of Arizona. <laughs> and no mention that they that they were a, a a sponsor of the early Wizard magazines, man. That's amazing. Talk about like the speculator boom. You know what? Before I went on, I wanted to just point out Astro City because yeah. we think about like you know the '90s as this dearth of any kind of you know good good comics. It's just this shitty like speculator uh, you know boom and bust. But Astro City, Kurt Busiak's uh, beloved superhero series, starts here in 1995. And um, I can remember seeing Brett Anderson, at yeah. the, uh, the, the artist for this, at San Diego Comic-Con with pages from Astro City. Really cheap. I wish I would have bought like a big stack of them. But, you know, definitely a series that I know a lot of people love yeah. and uh, launched in the middle of this. So we're going to see some interesting comics kind of listed, you know, um, despite the market at large maybe taking a nosedive and a lot of bad choices. But uh, there, there were some, some interesting things coming out as well. Busick was one of the guys that was holding shit together. He did a few interesting things at this time, because I think Untold Tales of Spider-Man is mentioned in this issue, too. So like probably. he's really like parlaying that Marvel's success into some good books. Yes, and, and that was probably, the, I mean, in those middle 90s, that was probably the only one of the only good books coming from Marvel. Yeah, especially this, the superhero stuff. Uh, Norm Brayfogel doing Bloodshot. It's it's a bummer that these comics aren't very good, but I I'm a sucker for Norm Brayfogel, and that's such a uh, it's he's my favorite Bloodshot artist. There, Absolutely, so. yeah. Some nice envelope art, like kind of crazy that the the amount of detail people are putting on these envelopes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a competitive medium at that <laughs> really point, man, because it's a very popular magazine. Uh, you could imagine that they must get dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of contributions. So uh, the the. The, the, the wheat separates from the chaff pretty easy when you have a sample of that that magnitude. Yeah, very impressive. And, uh, you know, she winning the uh, the award to give you, again, that idea of bad girls and, and indie self-publishing, creator-owned books. Still a trading card era, man. Yeah, definitely. And that comes into play in a little bit. So the big story in the news is Marvel and Heroes World. And we've mentioned this. This isn't the first mention. It's been, uh, you know, talked about for the previous issue or two. But we're, we're sort of seeing what Marvel's going to do with this new distributing model that they're putting together. And uh, the winners are Marvel, the newsstand market, which remains unaffected by all of this. That's, that's an interesting take. Larger mail order companies, because, you know, harder to get your, your books, so that's where to go for. And uh, Heroes World. And it's so funny because, like, six months from now, <laughs> Marvel and Heroes World uh, bankrupt, <laughs> you know? So they, they pick their winners, and in in, in maybe they miss it by a little bit. Losers are DC, uh, Diamond, the direct market, small press, press and independent publishers, other distributors like Diamond and Capital City. Capital City, of course, not long for this world. 
um, and comics readers, and you get Mike Richardson, you know, uh, coming in on that, weighing in on that. And uh, one can only hope that these changes will not devastate a market that has served our industry well. Talking, of course, of the direct market. So everybody kind of recognized, and we've talked to people about this that were, uh, you know, involved in, like fanographics publishers and stuff at the time. Everybody kind of saw the writing on the wall. Of this was going to be a uh, could be a devastating move, um, certainly a big move, and it did turn out to be devastating for you know they mentioned small press and indie publishers. We talked to guys like Steve Bissett, like they just leave comics. You know, it's it really um, destroys the way self publishers, the business model self publishers were enjoying in the first half of the '90s, just goes away once all these distributors go go belly up. Right. And a lot of them leave those guys on the hook for printing bills that they don't, you know, they don't pay for the comics they take as they're going. The the distributors are going bankrupt and leaving the business. It just it just ruins a lot of publishers and self publishers. Still feeling the effects to yeah. to this day. You know, there's one one real distributor in comics. I think I think there's like more that have crept up uh in the wake of COVID or I guess in the midst of COVID, I guess. And uh we still feel the effects from this exact situation. And and Marvel man, like they had an infusion like no other with your Spider Man's and your X Forces and your X Men's X Men cartoon, the licensing of the toys, it's all big. So they're in mergers and acquisitions mode. You know, they buy their own distributor. Like, hey man, we're making all this money. Like, how can we make more? Let's cut out the the piece that we have to give to all these distributors. We'll do it ourselves, man. Uh, but little did they know that the infrastructure required to serve your customers is much bigger than what Heroes World can handle, and that fucks them up. They already bought Fleer Trading Card Company. So now they're acquiring Skybox. $150 million. And I think the other one was $500 million. Yeah, it was a lot. Uh, so we're get, approaching a billion dollars worth of comic bo- of uh, trading card companies. You see what it is, though. Stock market analysts are calling the acquisition a good move for Marvel. That's what they were doing with all of these purchases and all these moves. It was all like stock manipulation stuff. And there, there are books on that subject about you know Marvel specifically in the 90s. So you know if you're interested in that, there's definitely more information out there. But... It was just as much speculator nonsense as was going on in the direct market. It's like that's what Marvel was doing behind the scenes yeah. with, 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 with the hundreds of millions of dollars worth of businesses. One, one piece on the previous page real quick is uh, this is the first real mention of Warren Ellis in the pages of Wizard Magazine. And we're going to see much more of him as time goes by. He was a writer of Doctor Strange comics after David Quinn, the Faust mm-hmm. writer, bounces. Uh, David Quinn was tasked with kind of tying up a lot of weirdness in uh, the Doctor Strange comics up to that point. And then Warren Ellis is describing how he sees the Doctor Strange character as, you know, a hero in the Marvel Universe, much smaller stories, magical stories, yada, yada. But worth noting that, you know, he gets his first little piece in here because we're going to go to an article where another writer gets his first piece. And these are revolutionary writers who become very important to the medium after a while. Burned as Wonder Woman. I uh, I had a, a mail subscription. Wow. To this, uh, after reading this article, it was I, I was at a point where you know I knew Burns comics and I wanted to be in on the ground floor of something of his man because I was always uh, late to the party. I bought all those off the uh, stands. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so like I still have very fond memories of these being delivered to to my old house and homestead, man, month in month out, folded in half to my chagrin course, and yes. stuff, man. But uh, pretty. The good news is they're not. I don't know that they're worth anything now, so it's not like that. Uh, that hurt hurt their their value. They were really inspiring to me, man, because they felt uh, they felt a little rushed. They felt a little yeah. dashed, you know. He, like I think he's inking himself, mm-hmm. and it looks like there might lettering even be himself sh- too. Sharpie, yeah, yeah. The, the lettering was real sharp. Uh, a lot of air around those those uh, dialogue bubbles, which I which really uh, just made it easier to read, frankly. Um, but. A, re- a solid run of comics to me, man. Like, what, 30, 40 issues, something like that? I'm trying to think of uh, any of the news or anything that, that popped out. And I don't remember too much. Did anything stand out to you in uh, in any of these? No, not too much. Uh, Jim Lee doing lots of pinups for people, man. Um, doing stuff for she, she pinups, doing Ash pinups. Techno is still... Uh... Still buying some some ink. This is so fucking ridiculous, by the way. So yeah, it's so, terrible. So Leonard Nimoy has Primordials, <laughs> and and he he insists that they hire a science expert because he wants he wants the science talk in his comics to be legitimate. Yeah, 
No kayfabe. Ridiculous. Real dumb. Uh, Image Comics News, they list Super Patriot, which the artist is Dave Johnson on that. I always like those Super Patriot comics that yeah. he drew. Oh, they yeah. looked really cool. Kind of neat to see what everybody's doing, you know, in, in terms of the studios there at Image. Uh, Vampirella's still big. Oh, there's your Kurt Busiak, you know, talking about some of the stuff he's doing, like Untold Tales of Spider-Man, New Shadowhawk, Astro City. So, yeah, man, keep him busy. Like like I said, parlaying that Marvel success into, into some work. To me, this is the culmination of the Keith Giffen trencher style. Like, when he starts incorporating black into the mixture with that kind of manic line mm-hmm. work, like, that makes all the difference in the world to me uh, in terms of clarity. The second issue of this is a wild comic. It's like super meta, breaking the fourth wall and stuff, but also like applied to like 90s comics excess. It's kind of a neat issue, and and maybe something we'll look at at some point. Oh, you know what? The Wild Storm note is Alan Moore becomes regular writer of Wildcats. So probably probably worth noting. Will Eisner mentioned in Under Kitchen Sink as well. Yeah, yeah, Dropsy Avenue is coming out, man. A really good comic. Yeah. Really, really cool comic. Kamiko's coming back. I don't know how long they last, but I, I have seen some of these like mid '90s Kamikos. They're they're a little bit different. Yeah, it's a Tony Daniel uh, Elementals. Yeah. Don Heck obituary. Yeah, rest in peace, Don Heck. And then uh, like the up and coming, and it's this guy. And I think one of the first things is like at some point I'm going to have to take a break. I think he's taking a break since 1995. <laughs> this guy, man, because because I don't I don't recognize him. You know what? You say that, but if you read like the the books that he's done. He's got like 30 books in here, you know, like for an up and coming for like a new guy. Like he's drawn two books a month and stuff. X Mutants 1 to 9 is, is on his resume. So like doing an indie book that couldn't have paid anything, right? It's, it's kind of a crazy like what his output is in this uh, in, the, in a very small time frame. Doesn't that look like a portly grifter? It does a little bit, yeah. <laughs> like, a, like a cosplay. Like, like he had uh, Kurt Busiek put on the grifter mask and, and uh, draw from life. It looks like uh, Barry Windsor Smith might be powdering out also in the background <laughs> or anything. The simplest of the covers that we're going to see for that. This article is garbage. This is, uh, the, it's like a survey of, I think there's a new Batman movie coming up. So you got to have Batman, right? I mean, look, cover feature, right? right. Got to feature Batman in this new movie. They don't say anything in this. They've, they've, There's nothing. They've written this article. Like, we've covered this article in five other Wizard magazines. And it's all the same cliche stuff. So so you got the pro, the the regular Batman writers. You got Doug Munch. You got... Chuck Dixon. And uh, Alan Grant. Alan Grant. Uh, so you have all the same cliche stuff of um, the alter ego is not Batman. You know, like, like the costume is Bruce Wayne. And each of the guys says it. Uh, each of the guys says that... Gotham City is a character. Each of the guys says that yeah, Gotham Al- City Al- character. Alfred Alfred Pennyworth is is the 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 foundation, the the main <laughs> beam of of Batman comics. How boring is your article when Alfred is what you're telling? <laughs> Also, no mention of Brian Bullen drawing that piece or, or any of the artists. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> um, Batman Forever, you know. I think pretty universally panned. This is not much. Yeah, sure. But yeah, this is just weak. Even the art they choose to show. Great, great image. That was not one I was copying in my notebook or sketchbook at the time. Yeah, pretty underwhelming, this article. There, there, there are certain parts that are kind of interesting about um, the the different kind of approaches that that the writers kind of, kind of take like Chuck, Chuck Dixon coming from a certain point of view, the other guys from fair enough. But you know, that Chuck Dixon, uh, info that was issue 44 is when Chuck Dixon had his in-depth interview. It's and, like the they're thing. referencing it. Yeah. It's you know, like thing. there's nothing new in this article. Yeah, no, of course. Kelly Jones, Batman's hard. There was a couple Kelly Joneses, <laughs> man. And you know what? It's the, his obliques, man. He, he's got the best obliques in, in, <laughs> uh, might be right. in Batman comics. <laughs> yeah. It, it always kills me that like, this was your main Batman for a long time, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, he was a regular artist for so long, and it's that's pretty radical. I'll give uh, I'll give Denny O'Neill some props for, like, letting Kelly Jones be Kelly Jones. Totally. That's a good call, because that's, that's some good stuff. This is the, to me, this is the heart of this issue, the Chaos right. Theory. Brian Polito, publisher of Chaos Comics, talking, kind of talking real in-depth shop about self-publishing. I love it, dude. Like, Stephen he- Hughes, by the way, a great, great... The late Stephen Hughes, one of the uh, great indie artists. Yeah, rest in peace, Steve, Stephen Hughes. Uh, it's inferred in in this issue, and I'm going to like make some projections of 
from from my own point of view because it's not in there spe- explicitly. But essentially, these guys they get their Eternity Comics, Evil Ernie comic together. Mm-hmm. Uh, it does business. They take that money and apply it to their own self publishing efforts because they were not happy with the promotion and uh, the sort of salesmanship of a publisher to get this thing out there. Polito seems like a guy who's pretty aggressive in trying to get the stuff done that he wants done. He's a writer. He put an ad out in like that, like what's what was that newspaper, that weekly newspaper? Comic, Comic Buyer's, Buyer's Guide. Guide. Uh, vetted about 70 people, which, you yeah. know, that might be a silly number, but it, he's at least implying that dozens of people showed up. Yeah, he says Hughes is the seventy second yeah. to uh, to send in to, yeah. to respond, and that could be that could be a, f- a funny thing to say. But he not only did he vet people for a while, but he went to go visit this guy. You know, he's he's expensing money because he wants to get his he wants the perfect guy to like draw stuff. That's a very forward think. It, like that's you believe in yourself. I like a guy who believes in himself, man, and uh, because you have this idea that you think is good. And you need the right execution. You get the guy to draw the thing for you, and then you go with a publisher, and and you're not, you're not getting what you want. Cause like, listen, we're squeaky wheels here at Cartoonist Kayfabe, and we work with publishers, and uh, a lot of cartoonists think that their job is done when they give the comic to the publisher, and they wash their hands of it. A publisher's not exactly used to loud creators who were like, hey, what about this? What about that? Can you do this? Hey, man, send me an email about that. Why didn't you tell me about this? Blah, 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 blah. Um, But if you want to have some agency over your career and maybe not just like languish and leave your hard work up to strangers, you got to be a little bit forthcoming, interact with people, try to insert yourself in every piece of it, whether you're a bit annoying or not, because this is your life we're talking about. You have bills to pay, you know. You can't leave it up to the dudes at Malibu to to have your uh, advocacy in mind. Got to advocate for yourself, and I think that that's something that Polito uh, communicates really well uh, through throughout this this uh, article. By the way, I, great summary because like he goes through and says a lot of what you're saying. You know, like second paragraph in finding talent after you know going to meet with Stephen Hughes, liking what he sees in terms of art, is uh, work out an agreement. That spells out payment, rights, reprint fees, rights in other media, all this stuff. And it's like there's, you know, mention of an entertainment lawyer in order to make this official. Like it's really doing it right. You know, setting a budget when you talk about like, hey, these are your dollars that are being spent. Damn right they are. Uh, selecting printers. He talks about, I think, you know, maybe 15 different printers that he that he dealt with trying to figure out what was the best fit for him. Um, it's a lot of work. And he kind of really, they get into some of that work. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, it's it gets pretty deep. impressive. It gets it gets really deep, man. It gets really deep, the idea of overprinting. Listen, man, if you just print to order, uh, it's, a, it's a no-lose situation because you know how many copies you've sold. You'll, these are sold copies. Like, you won't lose one dollar, but you're not going to grow your audience in any way. Uh, Jeff Smith, this, this piece right here, tips from other self-publishers is really cool too. Cause guys like Jeff Smith has a philosophy of keeping the early issues in print Yes. so that, uh, you have a, you now have a catalog. You put that in the back of your other issues. You're receiving checks from people. Imagine the bitch of that back in the day how it's not like instantaneous loot. You're just getting a bunch of checks. Oh, it'd be a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Especially if you're monthly or bi-monthly, like several issues out there before you're getting paid, which is what cost a lot of these guys when distributors went out of business, really screwed them up. But you're on the hook for the printer. You know, like it is like a lot to keep track of for one guy and continuing to both create and promote. Um, it is interesting hearing all these self-publishers. Interesting, Chris Crosby of Snap the Punk Turtle. Never heard of this dude or that book. You know what's funny is uh, he must be juiced in with the guys at Wizard because there will be a future issue where it might be about self-published comics. It might be a Palmer's Picks. You're going to see what Snap the Punk Turtle looks like. <laughs> of course. And uh, and this guy will be talked to. So, so there are just those guys that like... I don't know if they just know somebody at Wizard or something, but like, there's always a sore thumb that will show up throughout the throughout these comics. Quick Brian Polito story, man, in terms of just like salesmanship or whatever. This could have been a genuine moment, but it felt like it would be good, just salesmanship on, on his part. Like Pittsburgh Comic Con, it was essentially a 24 hour festival. Like, right. like at the, at the end of the day, you know, if you're not 
part of the Illuminati and sneaking up to the penthouse and like playing cards with Buzz and, and those guys. There's, at the very least, the movie rooms are, are playing movies literally 24 7 and uh we were watching um because you couldn't even download flicks at the time so it's like this is an opportunity to see sure this movie or that movie i don't even remember what the stuff was but um there was a movie playing that that i heard about and i always wanted to see and it was playing very late like 1 a.m or something polito popped in you know there's six people in this room and Polito popped in and was like, oh, I've been wanting to see this movie, blah, 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 blah. And he sat there and he kicked it and he watched this movie. And it blew everybody's mind that he's like a regular dude, like wants to like check this flick out. Now, are you selling stuff to six people? Right. Like, it could have been a genuine moment. Seems smart. Maybe he, maybe he did that a couple of times a day. <laughs> I don't know. But it was a cool thing. You know, it was a cool thing to witness. Yeah, that's cool. I've never met him, but uh, reading this article kind of makes me curious. You know, hearing Joe Quesada talk about it makes me curious to uh, to talk a little bit with Polito. And one of the one of the notes, several of the notes in here, they talk about marketing. Um, you know, the other self publishers, and they say take your promotional money and aim it directly at the retailers. I feel like that's still relevant today. And uh, you know, second printings. This is the thing that deviates with Jeff Smith a little bit is that Polito was aiming towards collections, book yeah. collections, as opposed to keeping like those early issues in print. And, you know, talks about the reasoning behind that. But uh, got to love this, too, mistakes. There's a lot of talk of Murphy's Law, of uh, having that whatever your budget and time is, add some. Mm -hmm. Because things go wrong. Or they can. Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, stuff about shipping on time. Like, like, these guys are more professional than the image dudes. It's like, we have four issues done yes. whenever we do a new miniseries. Like, his thing is like, let's do these blasts. Have them come out regularly because it's it's uh, it's a compromise to even be bi monthly. Like you wouldn't be monthly when you have a blast. We take a little time off. Steve draws everything, and then by the time the issue one comes out, uh, we start we like the the thing is complete. I love this photo in the back because you could tell they have maybe like a little small apartment that is Chaos right. Comics or something, and that's inventory back yes. there, dude. Like those are printer boxes. You know what? I like all of these pictures i don't know who's art directing the photo shoot but they're pretty good looking yeah i sure hope that that isn't the lighting that steve hughes has to draw these things because i would explain his spectacles you know you can't poor be, guy yeah you can't be drawn in, like like brian i get it man you want some ambiance and shit like this i, I, I have a feeling those are color gels we used to uh we used to do that at my day job and that's what it looks like to me i like the licensing note too I don't go after licenses. Licenses come to me. Self-publishers should worry about making a good comic book first. The rest will follow. That's uh, I love that because we live in an era where people, a lot of people make their comics. is like, this is what I hand out at the pitch meeting. Yo, totally. So, like that part. Go uh, through this. Let's not even talk about that. I'll say one thing. Every actor in here, super old for like a teenage book. It's the it's an era. Yeah, I just watched Fast Times at Ridgemont High a, a couple days ago. Yeah, I ago. guess that's fair. I like the color guide here. So this is the uh, a little bit of talk on the Superman versus Aliens, which we cover on a previous video. By all means, go check it out. Great Kevin Nolan on top of Dan Jurgens. But uh, I like seeing like the painted color guide because I think it's flat color mostly, uh, you know, in the printed book. But it looks cool here, painted. I like. I I was under the impression that this was going to be the color of the of the comic. Yeah, that'd be neat. Uh, a shame that it's not the. The Dan Jurg, you know, this is all Dan Jurgens talking. Yes. And the way he describes his comics in interviews and things, it's far different than Adrian Tomina, <laughs> who we're going to see at the end here. And in the very, very fucking last paragraph, the, the name Kevin Nolan is mentioned <laughs> at the very, 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 very end. Yeah. Uh, I can it, tell you Kevin Nolan was the number one reason I bought the book. <laughs> it's ridiculous. This whole shit, man. That is what it is. That's comics. All right, man. More Barry Windsor Smith. I wish Barry Windsor Smith was like... I wish I had like, you know, 10 pages of Barry Windsor Smith in every Wizard magazine. Yeah, totally. So this is what he's drawing, James Robinson writing. This is an era where about five to ten comic writers wrote everything. James Robinson, Mark Wade, Kurt, Kurt Busiek, uh, Graham Morrison. Um, it's, 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 it's the same... Batch of Chuck Dixon wrote 10 books a month. Yeah, Dixon wrote about as many as everybody else put together. 
Uh, drawing board, always kind of fun. Surprised to see married married with children as uh, as their uh, big big winner on that. One, one of the early issues that we did, it showed off some now comics married with children, and and I I posited to you, Jimmy, what, how many issues of this do you think came out there? And I gave the answer. And I think it was over a hundred issues. <laughs> Jeez, that's it's just mind numbing. I like uh, the early the the Judge Dread Lobos fun. That's a very polished. I, I'd be mad if I did this and I was the runner up. The spawn thing looks yeah. like they really put the effort in. There's also, um, I think it's in this issue. They talk about Grendel Prime, some really good indie stuff. Bone, Grendel Prime, Scud. Um, they they talk about how Studio like Studio Ghibli joint. Oh yeah, yeah, Totoro. Right. Um, how the European artists like they compare European artists versus American artists in the art submissions, and oh. they say that the uh, European stuff is is typically more creative. But a lot of cool indie characters in this one. Greg Capullo's Crash Course. I think this is his first one. This is the first one. And, Jimmy, I put it to use right after reading this article. Like, he's breaking down facial facial sh- stuff. Eyeballs, how the eyes work, how the nose works. like And, and the simple ways to break it down. And uh, I used some of his ear techniques... <laughs> Literally yesterday. That sounds so funny. <laughs> Listen, we're artists. I mean, what the fuck? I do this like the game we're playing. Like he presents it as like this is fundamentals. This is lesson one, and it's you know it's going through these fundamentals. His drawing courses are some of the most instructive of, of like all, all of the, these things, man. And uh, as we do further issues of this, um, these are things to look forward to, like like his his crash courses. But uh, dude, like the back three quarter of ears, not easy. That's true. Um, and just seeing him break it down in this way, like I put that shit to use right away. Uh, when he's talking about like all you got to do is like change certain proportions, these all look the same to me. But I, but I get <laughs> but I get what he's saying. Uh, here's a little bit better. He he describes it as like pulling right. out the drawers, you know, pull out the nose, pull out the chin, pull out the forehead a little bit. You got you got different guys. Like still, they look so similar. They but, do. But the principle is there, and like you 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 know what he's talking about. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, you know, I like that approach of a strong foundation. And the basics will enhance your drawings. So. Kind of curious as we keep going through wizards to see his future lessons because I'm at you know like I'm I don't think I bought a wizard from this point forward. The despite my, 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 my letters, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta track that down now. <laughs> uh, the usual, you know, they they're always chasing television and different media. Nothing really stood out here too much. I like the the cyber force designs, but um, meh. And it never sees the light of day. Freddy vs. Jason. That's something that actually happens. Man, Liefeld dominated this stuff. I feel like he always had some tidbit of who he's meeting with. Tom Cruise name dropped in there. Yeah, and there's Prophet. I think Prophet is finally like, uh, you know, he he at least is pimping that. Yeah, Paul Galassi doing the uh, the cover part of that. What's left of Valiant? Such bullshit. You got to tell who these guys are. Can't even see those in, things, in, man. In the sky, and 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 two or three of them all look the same. Yeah, not not too surprising. I was just thinking about that. How like everybody would criticize Image for all their knockoff X-Men. Yeah. But, like, at this point, X-Men has 50 characters, and, you know, 39 of them are knockoff X-Men. <laughs> yeah, for sure. This ar- Dude, this article couldn't have come at a perfect time for me personally because I'm going back and reading uh, Fantastic-, Fantastic Four from the jump, and-, and probably a day or two before reading this article, man, I read uh, issue two with uh, with the scrolls, and I thought that the ending was so great, man, where, like, they just turn the scrolls that are like, left on Earth, they, t- they hit... Reed Richards hypnotizes them, and they turn into cows and are just like off in a pasture. Little did I know that these characters were played off of a lot of times, and it makes perfect sense. Like John Byrne uh, used them in a story where their milk gets drunk <laughs> right. by, by people in some small town, and then uh, they start to be able to shape shift or something. But we're in the goth era, we're in the vertigo era. So this is uh, Grant Morrison and Mark. I'm calling him Mark Millar, even though we know it's Mark Miller, but everybody calls him Mark Talk Millar. Talk about a super tag team, man. Absolutely. The powerhouse. Think of what they've done since then. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the article points out that these guys are not known for their superhero works, which is super funny, man. Mark Mil- Miller at this point is a Swamp Thing writer, and Grant Morrison's doing his, like, Doom Patrol, his Animal Man, like, like his, his you know, his goths, goth superhero shits, man. But because we're in this era... The milk won't do. We got to turn these cows into fucking hamburgers. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like such a 
it makes total sense. It does. <laughs> That's what you end up with. Yeah. Um, Joey Cavalieri, editor of Marvel's 2099 line. I always know him as a longtime DC editor. Me too. The other guy that I want to point out, Tom Breaver is the, uh, the, the editor of this Scroll Kill Crew book. He's got to be the longest tenured Marvel editor, right? I, He's still there. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Like uh, when I was a kid, he um, he edited the uh, the X Men indexes, which were just like show you the cover, give you a little synopsis mm -hmm. of like the and and those things were so valuable to me, man. Because you're a kid, limited money at your hands, uh, you get a classic issue of X Men here or there, but to be able to read all about it was you know, su super important to me. Tell the people what they're looking at right there, Jimmy. Brennan McCarthy art. Yes. Brennan Mc and, and a sidebar here about Brennan McCarthy, who, you know, we've, we've interviewed him. We've talked about some of his like early eighties, like one of the first guys to come from the UK and, and really make a mark in the American comic scene. Amazing to kind of see his, his art and have a write up here in wizard magazine. It's uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, so so the idea of this comic, and 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 by the way, like they sell it pre pretty well. Like I think the art that we see in the initial page is like uh, is like what what you're probably getting, which is actually very boring. It is, and it's it's Steve um, uh, Yeo Yeowell. Oh, yeah, you're probably mispronouncing up. that from Zenith fame with Chris Ivy inks. And you're right, because I feel like he's a good artist, but that is not a very exciting like piece. Like, like, no offense to Chris Ivy, man, but. The stuff I see his name on, like in those like middle '90s Marvel, you know, Moon Knight, uh, a couple other things, um, just boring. Like the like the finish is just the most boring yeah. journeyman finish, you know. But but I I say like I I kind of want to read this comic. It does make me a little bit curious. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting collection of talent for sure. Speaking of talent, Dan Jurgens and Dick Giordano. All the way from Charlton and DC fame to Solar and, again, Valiant, what's left of it. That's a, uh, quite a team. This is another article that I kind of enjoy in this one, Making a Difference Comics Pioneer. Neil Adams reflects on his groundbreaking career. I think some of this is probably touched on in an earlier Wizard Neil Adams interview, but um, it's Neil Adams. Yeah. So that's, that's worth my time to read. And I do like that, that piece. Like This is just a lot of drawing for, uh, for that two-page spread. But he goes through and he talks about the state of continuity comics. Um, I guess Valiant or Acclaim has licensed some of those characters to publish. Um, so that's, I guess, why he's here is promoting it's some of its reprint. Some of it's new, some of it's reprint. But yeah, a lot of it is career overview. So you see influential Green Lantern, Green Arrow comics, influential X-Men run. Um, you know, Batman, obviously, what he's known for is is kind of returning batman from the campy 60s tv show into like that what would become the dark knight yeah this is where he tells a story about like wanting to do a batman comic goes to julie yep. schwartz the bat editor uh julie's like get the fuck out of here he goes in through the side door and does a brave and the bold uh comic does that for a little while and then when the letters start coming in from the kids julie schwartz he's from fandom so he's reading those letters and all the kids are like yeah the real batman is in brave and the bold julie schwartz is like why aren't you writing why, why aren't you drawing batman comics and he's like well julie i asked you and you said that i couldn't and he's like well you're right you're drawing them now man um talks about bringing uh illustration into comics like there's this part in here where he's going for illustration gigs the portfolio gets lost yes and he spent six months on that portfolio they're paintings uh he has no money so he's like okay i guess i'll draw comics like what happens if that portfolio doesn't get lost like he's not in comics anymore he's in the Mad Men era and he's making coke ads for the rest of his life and shit like it's possible Man, think of the the, uh, the impact that he's had on comics, and if that doesn't happen. Yeah. I mean, he, he was the guy who insisted on returning original art to the artists because they used to destroy it or just give it out to fans or whatever. You know, there was just no respect for it whatsoever. But he fought for a lot of this stuff. Like, he tells a story about he goes from DC to Marvel to get some work simultaneously, and usually guys would use pseudonyms because it just wasn't done, and he insisted, no, it's I'm Neil Adams, you put my name on the comics I draw. Um, which was kind of the way he tells it, surprising to Stan Lee, but yeah. that's what happened. Yeah, because cause Stan Lee's like, uh, isn't DC going to get mad? He's like, well, my name is New Adams. And then uh, Stan Lee's like, well, are you going to still do stuff for DC? He's like, yes. And he's like, well, Marvel has a policy of not 
participating in that. And Noah Adams is like, well, then I can't draw a Marvel comic, I guess. What do you think there? Like, what do they teach you in, in uh, day one of, of illustration and tangents and stuff <laughs> like that? What's the word for that? Um, scissors? S- scissors. <laughs> Docking. <laughs> if, if one of them happens to be uncircumcised and the other uh, is... <laughs> You know? Yeah, that's, that's an unfortunate choice. You wonder when you see stuff like this if it's um, the wizard editors know what they're doing. I think so. <laughs> but also, that is an iconic image. It is. From, from, from Dead Man. Maybe for those reasons. Talks about um, lobbying. I forget what position he had, but something in sort of a, uh, not a union role, but, but some kind of like a high up cartoon position. And, uh, Let's see. Yeah, it was just Academy like a of sc- comic comic book arts or something. He was the president of the Academy of Comic Book Arts, and his goal was to get Jerry Siegel and, and Joe Shuster, uh, Schuster a uh, a living off of Superman, who they were living in poverty at that point in the seventies, and so that was one of the things that he does. Again, going back to creator rights, um, did a lot of this stuff. You know, like like as a publisher continuity. This is uh, one of his books, too. It's, it's interesting, you know, good ad placement that they would put it here. But Samory, one of the long continuity books, and then apparently one that uh, Acclaim was going to publish. There are so many people, like, you know, it's exciting. Like, you grow up, you want to make comics. It's exciting when you're in the game. And uh, I I mean, I know a lot of people who just, they who don't know that they can even ask cert for certain things. They don't advocate for themselves. Uh, they're shy, they just they do the work. They keep their head down. They shut up and and uh, they collect their paycheck. Uh, but a lot of bad treatment can come from that. You know what I'm saying? So you need these guys who will just speak up a little bit. You know, like like have some fucking dignity and self respect. Yeah, he talks about the um, work made for hire provisions in copyright law going into effect at a, at a certain point, I guess, in the 70s, and then talking about like some of the books that they. They had a proprietor's interest in some of these projects um, that they would, I guess, back financially, like Bucky O'Hare, Freak Show, and uh, Cody Starbuck. And it it really, again, advanced these creator rights. You know, um, he says Star Reach was not taken seriously by anyone, which yeah. would have been like an alternative or, or some creator-owned book at the time. So yeah. They called it, it ground level. I, I would be curious to hear more people kind of talk about some of this stuff, because this is his point of view. So, of course, you know, he's the hero here. But what's the impact? You know, like next time I talk to Howard Chaikin, I'd be curious, like, how important was this for Howard Chaikin? Um, nevertheless, it's interesting that it's being spoken of. Mm-hmm. You know, if I were reading Wizard at this time, that would have been really important to me, just getting more information on creator rights and being able to stand up for yourself, as you say, Ed. It's such an iconic it's great. two-page spread. Phenomenal. Imagine, like, you see that delicate inking. Imagine what the pencils must have looked like in order to to, to get to that place. But, and I believe that's Tom Palmer Sr. doing yeah. the on the inks here. Yeah, for sure, man. Like he he always is lucky to have have really good inkers. They mentioned the death of Pee Wee yes. Squad. I was going to bring that up his movie. <laughs> and uh, it was mentioned in one of the earliest Wizards we did. And shouts to the Kayfabers who sent me copies of uh, Death to Pee Wee Squad, in which you see a knife fight between Dennis Cohen and Gray Morrow. As well as a dinner of the restaurant sequence with my publisher, Gary Groth, and uh, a, a kind of disguised Neil Adams with like a beard and stuff on. Weird. <laughs> so weird. Super weird. I feel like if you're Neil Adams and you see this ad like in the middle of your article, how mad are you? Yeah, this totally. is what comics look like now. <laughs> Spawn v- Valeria is mentioned. Yeah, we used to talk about that a lot. That was solicited everywhere. There was going to be a crossover with Todd McFarlane's Spawn that Neil Adams was going to uh, draw and publish, and McFarlane pulled it. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, you, you choose Batman instead of Valeria. And then... Uh, to... It says that his sales went from 300000 to well, 58000 well, 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 like you're burying the lead because he replaced the Spawn character with his Nighthawk character from the, the first... Uh, two-page spread yes. that introduces the the uh, piece. And it, it seems like he's surprised that, you know, <laughs> once you replace the character, for some reason it went from 300,000 down to just 58,000. Yeah. Ouch. I'm personally not a big fan of Batman. That's, that's some... Uh, I'm surprised Wizard doesn't pull that out as their giant uh, sidebar quote, right? Totally. That would get that would make a lot of noise today, you know. Like if that was if that was a Neil Adams tweet, that would be uh, imagine the uproar. Yeah, maybe maybe like uh, it, it's very fashionable to to uh, you know d- dislike Batman uh, at the, at this point. 
Uh, but he also does, it's worth noting that he mentions a lot about his uh, collaborations with Denny O'Neill. And yes. Things. Yeah, he, he comes up a few different times throughout the interview and talks about his legacy. And the legacy that he points out here in, in the closing is pretty much everything he brings to comics um, creatively. So, like, bringing that illustration stuff, um, you know, all the skills of storytelling, structure, and design. And he sees a lot of that being applied now widely mm -hmm. throughout comics. Um, <laughs> yeah. Don't care. Yeah, fuck it. Print anime, this is a survey of some of the publishers and what they're doing in terms of manga at the time. A lot of these companies not around Academy Comics, CPM uh, Comics, they were around for quite a while. I, I get those now and then. Graphic Visions, I don't remember, but of course Dark Horse and uh, Studio Proteus for a long time, uh, big manga publishers. Yeah, real interesting. Torn Smith gets the license to like do Dirty Pair yes. and then finds... You know, Adam Warren. Yep. And from the Joe Kubert school. From, yeah, and they, they make that happen. That, that's, that was something I was always kind of curious about because it's this Japanese property. How the heck does this this guy, Jin, uh, get, get, yeah, he's, he, I mean, he's synonymous with Dirty Pair to me. Yes, agreed. Toys don't care. Weapon Zero, Walt Simonson's uh, second dip into the top cow world. Mm hmm. Uh, all the bad girls. Yeah, I, I don't right. know what, what the theme is this issue, why they're doing it, but it's kind of cool to see all those mix of uh, DC, Marvel, and self-published stuff. And then Adrian Tomini, spotlighted in Palmer's Picks, always a highlight article. And uh, Optic Nerve is starting as a regular full-size comic book. I think one issue is out at the time of this, but he had been doing mini-comics. He had won a Zurich Award for the last issue of his mini-comic. And uh, he's 20 years old at this point. Yeah. And warrants this kind of coverage. So, pretty impressive. Um, we've, you know, looked at some optic nerves. We've interviewed Adrian and a phenomenal cartoonist and a guy dedicated to making comics, um, but probably one of the first uh, first mentions in Wizard, of course. It's it's uh, you're really swimming upstream, man. When, when you're when you're a kid making comics, especially on your own, because just just life, just just your community is an obstacle, man, that you have to wade through. And there's all this stuff at the end that, that was, like, triggering to me, man, uh, from when, from when I, like, I got in the game and shit, man, and I had to kind of, like, figure my life out much more, man. So it's like, uh, Tomina is definitely having a different college experience from his friends and roommates. They have a lot of free time to watch TV, go to parties, talk and sit around, and I just use all of that time to work on my comic. It doesn't make for a very fun... I, it doesn't make for a very f fun friend or boyfriend or anything. Um, it might be fun for a night to sit and get drunk, watch TV with your friends, but in the long run, that night isn't going to mount to anything. But maybe I might have finished a draw a drawing a page of comics that will stay in print for a long time. You just have to make decisions. Maybe when I'm 30, I'll regret having uh, lived these years as I have, but it's got me a lot of places that have really made me happy. Uh, I would bet he doesn't regret a second of it. I don't regret a second of it, man. Uh, it's the requirement uh, of comics to be dedicated and to put that pencil to paper and to say no to people. Uh, you know, Adam, um, Adam Carolla talks about it. It talks about the asshole period that one has to go through when you are in, involving yourself in something different from your like paycheck to paycheck homies or friends or work a day people in your life. Like if that's your circle. You're going to have to say no to things that, that, that you uh, said yes to previously. You're not available uh, in the way that you used to be. And, like, the second that Harvey P. Carr hit me up on that phone, dude, like, my life changed. No more bullshit. It's right. like uh, m my mantra growing up was, like, just give me a shot. Give me a shot, and I will hold on to that shit with a super tight grip forever. And the second I had that chance, it's like, all right, man, no more this, no more that, no more all kinds of bullshit. So just reading this piece. Yeah, some of it's important. in there. When he's talking about college and he's like, I go to school during the day and sit at my drawing board till three or four in the morning. It's the only way I can get it all done. That's such a that's such that like blue collar approach of like, hey, if you want to make a comic, that's what you got to do. We've I, all done a version of that. You know, I used to get up an extra hour early to do layouts when I had a day job because it was like. I can't do them after work. I'm, I'm burnt out then. I, I looked up to you guys so much, man, because uh, what I had to do was work for a couple of years uh, full force and just make this money to pay off my, my school loans. Then I made another round of cash that I saved to live on and then uh, knew a way to like get fired 
to have unemployment uh, benefits to just subsidize co comic making, you know? And, um, like, kicking it with you guys, you and Tom. Tom's on the bus inking to and from work. He's like a legend in Pittsburgh of just, like, this right. weird guy in the back <laughs> of the bus who, who sets up an art studio. And, well... There's no room on the bus and everybody's standing because he's taking up two, <laughs> two seats with all of his stuff. And then uh, I remember like you working on like a panel uh, a day for like um, on your on your on your lunch break for like this anthology we were a part of back in the day. Like I really looked up to you guys being able to compartmentalize your day. Like yeah. that's that's that's. Somebody who really wants to make comics, finding a way. Gotta prioritize. And I just could like, I had to, because I I can't stop and start. Like, when I get started, I have to keep rocking until I accomplish it, my task for the day. So I had to fully quit work, you know, in order to try to make this thing happen. It took two months to, to, like, get that job, which was nothing. It made me mad that I didn't try way earlier. But, um... Yeah, like, there's just very meaningful article. Um, two last notes I want to point out. One is that at age uh, 17 is when he starts publishing those mini-comics, and at this point he's 20. He had also gotten a gig for Pulse Magazine, which was Tower Records Store Magazine, which led to a, a cartoon or comics in Details Magazine. Pretty high-profile gigs for you know a guy doing mini comics yeah, yeah, yeah. at the time. And then the other piece is when he starts the Optic Nerve full-size issues switches over to fictional stories. And I think that's noteworthy because like he had done auto bio in some of those mini comics and auto bio look at what DNQ's publishing, you know, or or any of these alternative comics at the time. Auto bio was a huge genre. And so to make the choice to go to fiction, I think has served him really well and is a pretty astute decision at age twenty. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Uh just one other piece some of his call outs are like the Murderer's Row of Independent Comics yeah, of, of the nineteen nineties, Love and Rockets, Eight Ball, Acme Novelty Library, Dirty Plot, Peep Show, Palookaville, Hate, calling out stuff like uh Deep Girl by Ariel Bordeaux, uh King Cat Comics by Friend of the Show, John Porcelino. Girl Hero, Megan Kelso, Softboy, Archer Pruitt, the, the the other Chicago guy that everybody f usually forgets about, just because he didn't do, like, all that much yeah, work. Yeah, right. Yeah, you see that list, too. Like, the more you would read these magazines, the more you would see that same list the, over the and same, over. The Trinity, man, Hate, 8-Ball, and uh, Acme Novelty, over and over and over again. Ed, I'm going to skip ahead here. Uh, I don't know if there's any picks worth mentioning. There's um, there's one piece uh, worth mentioning, and it's that Sandman is in its like last run. That's like, right. like I thought that it was it was over at this point, but it's not. It goes to I think issue seventy five, mm -hmm. uh, and this is the last big big uh, story before before it's toast. Uh, the Comics Watch has uh, the first Joe Matarera, um issue of uh, of X Men. Trade bullets listed in there, but uh, I was going to skip ahead to the Todd McFarlane. Yeah, let's call him. I don't know if there's anything. Let's top do 10 that. comics are kind of status quo. Yeah, let's do that uh, with the proviso. Well, not proviso. But There's your Bisley cover, by the way, okay, for yeah, Judge yeah, Dredd that's yeah. coming Look up in the next piece, issue. Baby. <laughs> that's a bulge in those pants. Worth noting that still to this day, it's something that we were keeping track of for a while. The Miracle Man issue number fifteen is still just a two dollar book, uh, and it's not called out. Uh, uniquely in any way it's just another issue of miracle man so like we're gonna see a skyrocket happen it hasn't happened yet yeah that's pretty interesting um always curious how that occurs i will also point out the first appearance of cable is at 40 bucks which is probably a near low for uh since we've been looking at wizard magazine could be so the ego column todd mcfarland's monthly column in the back of wizard here is what do you want from me and and this is a kind of a wild article because he's asking like you know, comic sales have plummeted. What do people want to buy? And he talks about how people complain about crossovers and gimmick covers and stuff, but they're selling. Yeah. So is that what you want? Um, I think it's genius because, because it's interesting. Th this is a uh, widely circulated magazine. He's using his platform right here f to test market. You know, it, it's a genius application of, of, of his, his column inches. And it is him just try, try, like, kids, I can't figure you out. You know, like I, like I told you, I'm not going to do gimmicks. I, like, we're just going to try to do a solid, great comic. Yes. Uh, the best that we can. 
it ain't working out. Like, do you want me to do start doing some miniseries? Would you like me to kill him off and bring him back? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Would you like to see him cross over with every other character in the Image universe? Would you like to see him maimed and replaced by some wacko, only to have the original come back and trash the new guy? Cutting some promos on what was going on, but also it feels like genuinely trying to just like figure out what is going on, like yeah. what are people into. So kind of a different. A, a different column, and then this little addendum about um, from from a previous column. Oh, and by the way, about Marvel Comics announcing that it's distributing exclusively through Heroes World. I told you so. You're right. <laughs> and Jill Thompson in the uh, Wizard profile, uh, a good artist. Already, she's in, on doing these watercolor like should be kind of style, and um, always an interesting artist. Works in several different styles in different media, and kind of cool to to uh, get her profile here. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. She did a lot of um, Elementals, working on some Swamp Thing with Mark Miller. Comics she's currently reading, anything by Paul Pope, also Optic Nerve. Pretty good, uh, you know, tr True Swamp by John Lewis, Cud by Terry LeBan. Like, uh, she's, she's reading indie comics. Totally. She's from that space, man. It's just she she, she also has, like, that reverence for, for you know, like, that pseudo-mainstream Kind of, kind of stuff. I mean, that's, that's you know, she's a working artist, man. That shit's what pays the bills. Things you collect. Uh, I've got bits <laughs> of skeletal stuff. I have a real human rib given to me as a Christmas present. <laughs> Most of it is representative, not real, but I, I have real bones, and I have a badger skeleton. <laughs> it's the 90s, you know? Like, uh, you, you, had, you had the gangsterish energy on one side, the extreme energy on one side, and then you had full-bore goth uh, energy on the other. So yeah, she's, it's it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. The way she closes it out is so great too, because that's a cut in a promo. Why do you read Wizard <laughs> to see what the image guys are up to? <laughs> and you know what? Those guys uh, at Wizard are so dumb that they're like, oh yeah, me too. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, Spawn Thirty Two new costume. I don't remember much of a new costume. It feels like you got a boot or something. Got, some spikes. Got that little gauntlet. Wow. That's all. <laughs> that's the new shaking it up. True Lies video game. So another issue of uh, Wizard in the can. Yes, man. I'm telling you, it's still reasonably good, man. Like that new Adams <laughs> interview, that self-publishing thing with, with uh, Chaos, the Greg Capullo shit. Uh, they still have a couple, you know... Optic nerve. There, there's some stuff in this one. When they have three pieces, like that's the best you could do. That's as good as it ever was. Yeah. You know, it was never unanimously good. Uh, they'll still continue to have that for a little while, man. And probably even, you know, you, you just don't remember, Jim. But there's clear evidence that you wrote some letters. I don't not remember. I, I just didn't buy these anymore. So this well, is new to me. This is uh, catching me up on June 1995 comics uh, happenings. I don't know, Jim. You might you <laughs> might have just forgot that period. Uh, in your life. We'll as, get to the bottom of it. As per those letters. Wait till we get to episode 60 of the, the Wizard coverage, man. K favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel with the bell. Notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design. Tell your local comic shop to reserve a copy for you, to pre order a copy for you. Let them know that Hulk Grand Design is coming in March, celebrating 60 years of incredible Hulk comics and that you want your copies. So let your comic shop know that. And you can join me on Patreon at patreon.com slash jimrug. Red Room Comics, man. Red Room Trigger Warnings is coming out in March. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. Uh, you can get these at your local comic shop. Get them put on your pull list. You can pre-order at Fantagraphics uh, at my link tree in the description below this video. You can read the comics right now, this minute, at uh, my Patreon. Patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there. And uh, you can uh, read more than 200 pages worth of comics uh, at that spot. Like I said, we have link trees in the description below this video where you can get to all that stuff. Support us, support the channel. Uh, what else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Another great, great way to support the uh, channel. Jimmy, given those marching orders, we'll be on our way. Make more comics.